Hello and welcome. I'm Imran Garda, sitting in for Riz Khan. As the standoff in Egypt continues, will the spirit of revolution translate into something more concrete, or will the people be forced to return to the status quo? While protesters insist on Mubarak stepping down, Western governments have been conspicuously hesitant in their response. Fearful as ever that any movement away from autocratic secular regimes means an inevitable slide into radical theocratic governments hostile to the West and antagonistic towards Israel. But as Egypt tries to redefine its future, are there other political possibilities that move beyond these age-old stereotypes? Well, today we ask, can Egypt's revolt lead to new political alternatives? Rem remember, you can uh, join our conversation with your questions and your comments. Well, joining us now from Vancouver, Canada, is world-renowned Muslim scholar Tarek Ramadan. And from the Slovenian capital, Ljubljana, we are joined by world-famous radical philosopher Slavoj Žižek. Thanks a lot for joining us, both of you, uh, gentlemen. Uh, you. Tarek Ramadan, if I could start with you, do you think a revolution is taking place? Yes, I think that uh, uh, after what happened in Tunisia, what is happening now in, in uh, Egypt is just, uh, uh, it was unbelievable and it, it, it's still unpredictable, but it's a, a revolution and I think that we have to listen uh, to the people saying enough with dictatorship, enough with Mubarak and his regime and what we want now is more freedom, democracy, dignity and this is what uh, should be understood. Now anything which is built on that saying oh it's either the dictatorship or uh, radical Islamist and a theocracy and what is said about this is much more uh, ideologically oriented than the reality of what is happening now of a revolution coming from people on the ground saying we want a change in our country and we want freedom. Slavoj Žižek, you wrote about uh, former British Prime Minister Tony Blair, who's now the Quartet's uh, envoy, uh, having a sort of fear of this process that was unfolding in the interviews that he's given. And he spoke about the fact that uh, the West, as he defined it, needs to sort of manage the situation and the transition. He seemed to have a real serious fear of, uh, as to what was happening. Uh, what do you make of that? Was he implying that the Egyptians or the Arabs are not worthy of democracy? Well, of course, he wouldn't say this openly, publicly. But I think his message, if one can read between the lines, was quite unambiguous. You know that wonderful French proverb, plus que ça change, plus ça reste le même. The more it changes, the more it stays the same. So it's obviously that what Western powers, insofar as they were represented by Tony Blair. What they want was some changes which would basically enable the to global situation to remain the same. Against this, I would like to emphasize totally agreeing with what Tariq just said. Uh, one point, you know how often in our multicultural era where we all are suspicious about universalism, we like to hear how uh, uh, democracy as we understand it is something specifically Western. You should understand different cultures and so on and so on. But what affected me tremendously when I was uh, not only looking at the general picture of Cairo, but uh, listening to interviews with participants, protesters there, is uh, how cheap, irrelevant all this multicultural talk becomes. There, where we are fighting a tyrant, we are all universalists. We are immediately solidary with each other. That's how you build universal solidarity, not with some stupid UNESCO multicultural respect. We respect your culture, you ours. It's the struggle for freedom. Here we have a direct proof, A, that freedom is universal, and B, especially a proof against that cynical idea somehow Muslim crowds prefer some kind of religiously fundamentalist uh, 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 dictatorship, whatever. No, what happened in Tunisia, what happens now in Egypt, it's precisely this universal revolution for dignity, human rights, economic justice. This is universalism at work. What we see daily in Egypt, one Egyptian protester said, I'm proud that I'm Egyptian. I am proud for them. They gave us the lesson against this 
falsely respectful but basically racist prejudices you know oh uh, arabs have their specific culture they cannot really get it they got it they understand democracy by doing what they are doing better than we do in the west in western europe with our anti-immigrant parties and so on and so on so i'm proud for them i mean again here is universalism this is the best argument that you can see on TV against all that, uh, all that, uh, all that trash about uh, clash of civilizations and so on and so on. The moment you fight tyranny, we are solidary. No clash of civilizations. We all know what we mean. No miscommunication here. Tariq Ramadan, what do you think of that? I mean, looking at the possible alternatives on offer, uh, can Islamism or any a relationship to political Islam and secular liberal democracy uh, work together in any future of Egypt or any other country in the region? Look, uh, what uh, uh, Zizek is just saying now, it's so important that when we speak from where we are, you know, in the West or in the Western countries, we look at the situation in the Arab world and for years uh, the, the regimes there were supported by the West saying if it's not them it's going to be worse than them uh, with uh, radical Islamists and, and this is the way it was built so the dictators were saying this and the West were supporting these views and then supporting the uh, Tunisian people after they started their uh, uh, mass protest and, and their revolution so we are supporting democratic uh, values and principles and models when it suits us not in the West I mean not uh, abiding by our own values so I think that this is exactly it if we are serious about the universality of our democratic values and freedom and equality we have to be clear that this is the time to support the people in Egypt not to be silent to say okay wait and see and we'll see what the army and why because we are protecting security and we are protecting the state of Israel and Israel government saying we are supporting Mubarak because if it's not Mubarak it's going to be you know Islamist what is this what is this logic saying that the security of Israel is going to be a, a reality with dictatorships around it's, Israel? it's interesting this that you say that I, I mean I want to I want to ask you about this uh, this fear of uh, radical Islam, which we uh, seem to hear throughout the airwaves, particularly here in the United States, in Europe, etc. Do you think that if that was a real and tangible fear, that a country like perhaps Saudi Arabia might have been mentioned a long, long time ago, where women don't have uh, many rights, yes. they, uh, they can't uh, drive women, um, uh, for example, people can be sentenced to death for things like witchcraft and, and sorcery uh, in a place like Saudi Arabia, yet they've signed a $60 billion arms deal with the United States. Do you think that if this, this fear of uh, a radical interpretation of is Islam was sincere, that a place like Saudi Arabia no. would be at the center of the debate and not Egypt or any other place? Exactly. I think that if we are serious about that, how come we are speaking about human rights and, and women's rights and we are supporting from the states the Saudi, Arabia, Saudi Arabia's, Arabian regime without saying anything about what is happening within the country? I think that this is pure hypocrisy. Now, what is going on in Egypt, it's a mass, you know, that these are mass demonstrations. It's not led by the Muslim Brotherhood, as it is said, and this, you know, uh, spreading around fear uh, about radical Islamism completely uh, an ideological projection to protect you know their geostrategic interests and it's following uh, the the you know this propaganda coming from Israel saying we have to support Mubarak now what is going on with the Muslim Brotherhood first they are not the leading force there the second is within the Muslim Brotherhood you have trends you have people who are very close to the Saudi in what it what comes to the literalist understanding of Islam but you have also people very close to the Turkish you know interpretation of what it means to be faithful to Islam with the AKP party and the running party now in, in Turkey. And these people for the last 60 years, they were not radicals. They were law abiding, non-violent, anti-colonialist, and they want, they want freedom. The point is not this. We are talking now about women. We are talking about democratic processes. It's not the true reason. The right. true reason is that if you follow democracy in Egypt, if you follow uh, the trends, even the Islamists, the true question is, about 
about equal rights, autonomy, uh, having access to their economic wealth and not being under the pressure of the United States of America and also asking the state of Israel to abide by the, 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 the principles of the Palestinian dignity and not to have this peace process only with dictators forgetting the Palestinians on the ground. Uh, okay, Mr. Ramadan, I'm going to come back to you with regards to the Muslim Brotherhood a little bit later on because there's something I, I want to ask you which relates to you in a very personal okay. way, but we'll come back to that in about five or ten minutes' time. I want to go to Slavoj uh, Zizek now. Uh, Mr. Zizek, I want to yeah. compare these scenes that we're seeing in Tahrir Square of a million or two million people uh, marching for, for their dignity, for their rights, for democracy, uh, immensely potent scenes to the scenes that we saw when Saddam Hussein was toppled in Firdaus Square in Baghdad, where that statue came down. And it's difficult to actually tell with regards to the numbers, but there was a wide shot, and there were maybe 50 or 60 people in that square. And is there not a sort of delicious irony here that those pictures of Saddam's statue coming down with 50 or 60 people there were seen as conclusive evidence of the fact that the Iraqi people had had enough of him, whereas we've got these pictures of over a million people in Cairo, yet there's still doubt as to whether this is the right thing to happen. I totally agree with you. I will tell you, I spoke with a journalist who was there, namely when they were pulling down Saddam's statue. You know what he told me? He saw 20 minutes before Americans hiring people to go there and do it. This was not only, it wasn't only that it was just 50 people. This was simply a staged event. Uh, uh, United States did all, almost in a, in a textbook way, to illustrate it in a textbook, did all possible mistakes there. And now they are paying the price. But that's another topic. What I want to say is that, first, uh, all this scare about Islamism, religious tendencies of American people were, first, let's see who's talking. I read somewhere that in United States, you know, over 30% of the people believe in devil, in ghosts, and so on and so on. So, you know, coming from the United States, I don't think they have any right to deplore the religious naivety of the Muslim crowds and so on. Just go to the deep American south. I can guarantee you it's worse than maybe even many Afghanistan villages or whatever. Second point, all this stuff about Islam and so on. Uh, I think the choice is not, this is already Western ideology, uh, the choice is not Islam or liberal democracy. There are many wonderful things also going on in Islam. For example, I want to share this wonderful story with you. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Qatar visiting Museum of Islamic Art, and I found there a simple plate with a wonderful old wisdom, which says, an old... Uh, Iranian philosopher who said uh, only a foolish man when he misses a chance he evokes fate. So here we have a, a, a Muslim theology which is much deeper than this Western cliche image, oh they believe in fate, they follow everything. No, it says you are free to choose those who fail those who don't seize the moment, then they evoke fate to put the blame on some destiny or whatever. So uh, the problem is for me somewhere else. If the true choice is between Muslim fundamentalist theocracy or Western liberalism, we are lost. I think the true tragedy of the Arab nations is the disappearance of, not secular in the sense of e-religious, but secular in the sense of secularity of its demands, justice, freedom, and so on, of this kind of a left, non-fundamentalist, it can be Muslim, but non-fundamentalist left. This, for me, is the true tragedy. And I think that the rise of deplorable fundamentalisms is strictly something which entered the state, filling in this void of the left. And here I draw a much more radical conclusion. This is not just in Islamist countries. One has to repeat this again and again. For example, Afghanistan. 
It's presented in Western media as, you know, a, a, a crazy ultra-fundamentalist country. Sorry, I'm old enough to remember 40 years ago, Afghanistan was a very open, secularized country with a pro-Western technocratic monarch, strong local communist party. Then we know the story. Communists made the coup d'etat, Soviet Union intervened, American intervenes against. It's as part of this process that, that Afghanistan was, if I okay. may use this awkward word, was fundamentalized. Okay. So uh, for me, the p again, just to conclude, sure. the choice shouldn't be just Western liberal democracy or Islam fundamentalism. It's crucial to have a strong left. Only this can save us in Arab countries and in the West. Okay, let's ask Tariq Ramadan then. W many people's fears with regards to the situation in Egypt is that they draw a parallel to Iran 1979. And part of the, the argument in intellectual circles is to say that, yes, like Egypt, you didn't just have the Islamists uh, revolting against the Shah. You had many others, Marxists, leftists, etc. But what happened is once the Islamists took control, they purged the left and they purged the others. And that's at the nexus of their fear with regards to what possibly might happen in Egypt. Does that have any credibility whatsoever? No, look, this is, this is once again what I, what I told you. In some Western circles and coming from the Israeli uh, uh, propaganda, it's just to compare this and that and to say, look, this is going to happen. In fact, it's not at all the same situation. And, and if you look at what happened in Tunisia, this is a revolution uh, falling in the footsteps of what happened in Tunisia. And it's uh, the people, 30, you know, young people coming from everywhere saying to the dictator, you, for the last 30 years, uh, you have been running this country. You are preparing your son. We don't want you. We don't want the system. But the leadership is not at all an Islamist leadership. Look at what happened four days ago. They were trying to find someone, uh, El Barada, and they put themselves behind him because I think that there is a crisis here which is really who how they are going to to deal or, 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 or to, 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 to prepare the past Mubarak uh, era and this is something which is important we have to push them to come to an agreement and for the last uh, five years even the Muslim Brotherhood they were within the the movement and the whole the, the, you know this alliances uh, uh, that we had before the election Kefaya saying enough it's enough so I think that this is is uh, also something which is wrong even with the, 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 the history of the Muslim Brotherhood they are not at all uh, uh, following the footsteps of the Iranian revolution and their uh, perceptions uh, are not the same or their understanding over the last 30 years they have been changing a great deal yeah it's so interesting that me, you uh, sorry it's have, interesting that you that you mentioned that they've been changing a great deal because I mean on a personal note Hassan al-Banna your grandfather founded the organization do you think that the Muslim yeah. Brotherhood as it stands today uh, is the embodiment of the organization that he founded all those years ago and, uh, and evokes the no, same no, spirit no. and message that he envisaged? No, I think that there are changes here, and this is also due for, uh, to history. You know, he was before the repression. He was against the British colonization. He was an anti-colonialist movement uh, 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 dealing with education and, and working at the grassroots level first, and then came the repression on the Nasser's uh, uh, time and, and, uh, and regime. And he killed a lot of them. So you had people leaving the Muslim Brotherhood. They, were become, they, they became radicalized, and you had people who went into exile and some of them ended up in Saudi Arabia, others in, in the West, others in Indonesia and in Turkey. So it's a diversity of view uh, and they are evolving with history. And then uh, at one point they were saying no to democracy and they changed. They were saying no to women involvement in politics and they change again. So I think that they are moving and if we have to take an example is not to go to Iran but also to go to Turkey where you have people from Erdogan to from Erbakan to Erdogan, people are changing and, and there is nothing nothing that can be said about you know Islam is against democracy this is uh, once again these are slogans just to say uh, how to promote an idea that in our world we better go for dictatorship this is the way to get security and stability Understood. and we have to challenge this view and my point is here I disagree with some of the the leaders even from the Muslim Brotherhood by the way they are talking about Sharia and the way they are dealing with women the only way for us in the future if we want the true democratic processes 
is to challenge the people to say on this we uh, as long as they abide by the law they are uh, uh, serious about elections and they are uh, accepting the democratic processes before the elections and after the election we should challenge them let the people speak okay. and not torture them and not to accept that uh, coming from the West people are going to lecture uh, uh, the Arabs in the way they have to do I'm sorry to tell you what was said by uh, Tony Blair is just unacceptable for someone who just promoted the war in Iraq to come now right. in the name of democracy to tell us that we have to support Mubarak that's okay. not acceptable no fair point Slavoj Zizek I, I want to read an, an email from one of our viewers to you. Uh, you you can make your point but let's tee it up with this uh, email because I think they may be linked this okay. is from Arash Hakim Nia and he says uh, in his recent article Dr. Zizek cited Mao's phrase there is great chaos under heaven. The situation is excellent in relation to Egypt. Could he explain? Oh, of course, I'm not praising chaos. I know myself, I found myself a couple of times in a situation of public disorder, how dangerous this is. But let's be frank, without this momentary openness where you don't know who is in power, I mean chaos in this sense, where those in power are really well in a situation which i love you know sorry for this indecent metaphor but i love it you know in tom and jerry cartoons you have often a scene when a cat walks then it walks over the precipice and it's nothing beneath its feet but it doesn't yet fall down when it looks down and sees that it has no ground under its feet it falls down those in power must find themselves in such a situation in order to fall down. That's where we should push Mubarak. Just to, so that he will be above the precipice, no, nothing to stand on, as it were. But uh, linking to this, what do you mean by chaos? Listen, even Iran, which is called, as you see, there was a popular uprising, now what happened? The last troubles with Mousavi elections, the big demonstrations there, why don't read Egyptian events together with big popular upheaval after Mousavi election was stolen in Iran? So we see that even in Iran, the battle is not yet decided. Hardliners didn't simply won. People still want freedom and so on. In other words, what this means retroactively is that Khomeini revolution wasn't simply a fundamentalist Islamist takeover. There was a genuine democratic potential in it. Point two. There is one big difference, and here I totally agree with Tariq again, between Iran and Egypt. In Iran, the basic interpretive frame, the way the revolution understood itself, was nonetheless Khomeini, the unquestionable leader, revolution, and as it were, those leftists, Marxists, had, as it were, to smuggle themselves into it. In Egypt, it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. I saw two days ago an interview on TV with a member of Muslim Brotherhood. He had to speak the language of democracy, dignity, human rights, and so on and so on. As to this fear of Israel, that now if uh, Muslim Brotherhood takes over war with Egypt, we are lost, and so on and so on, they should worry about something else. What is so depressive about the latest development in Israel, namely how even United States renounced putting pressure on them to stop West Bank building and so on, WikiLeaks, is the following. I remember 10 years ago I was in Israel and all my liberal friends there were telling me, okay, we did injustice, West Bank, but listen, we have terrorist bombs, attacks all the time, we cannot negotiate okay. now. Let the Palestinians first stop bomb, but now they did stop not on the West, on the West Bank there is no so-called terror for five years. What is happening? The land is stolen from Palestinians even faster. Can you imagine what a depressing message this is? It is as if Israel wants to give the message to Palestinians. All right, let's Sorry, get, guys, but terror let's get works Tariq Ramadan, than peace. Let, let's get Tariq Ramadan to give us his final thoughts because we have run out of time. Tariq Ramadan, in less than 30 seconds, please. No, look, what my, my point here is as we are talking from where we are, it's really for us to repeat this and it's high time to be heard on that. We have to abide by our principles and to go for democracy and to support the people there. And this is a, a great responsibility for all our viewers here is to be 
quite clear that we can't, in the name of security, support a dictator and accept this emotional politics that we have around the world saying, if it's not dictators, it's going to be Islamists. And once again, Islamism is a multifaceted reality. Let us challenge the people, okay. listen to what they have to say, and understand that the Turkish example and other examples around the world could that just help us to get something which is, for the Muslim majority country, democracy, independence, and let the people decide for themselves. Gentlemen, that was immensely thought-provoking. Tarek Ramadan in Vancouver and Slavoj Žižek in Ljubljana. Thank you very much for joining us here on The Riz Thank Khan you. Show. And thanks to you, the viewer, for being with us. Remember, you can follow our program on Twitter. We'll keep you notified on upcoming shows. And you can send us questions and comments to pose to our guests. On the next show, will Egypt's revolutionary fervor spill over to the rest of the region? And what are other Arab leaders doing to contain it? Make sure to tune in for that. We'll see you next time.